Hey, hello everybody. Tonight, we're going to go through some more interesting case studies on how peptides are used in clinical practice. And we've got two fantastic experienced practitioners in the area of peptide application. Uh, first is Dr. Erica Schwartz. She's going to present her case. And then after that will be Dr. Gordon Crozier. Uh, I know that you're going to find these to be useful cases because guess what? They're real cases in the real world, just like the people that are coming in uh, to you every day. So uh, Dr. Schwartz, I, I'm going to be quiet and let you uh, take, take control. Thank you so much, Dr. Lavelle. And hi, Dr. Crozier. It's hi. nice to meet you, everybody. Um, thank you for participating. So I have a case that's actually a real case in the practice. Um, and I'd like to know how to make it go. Here we go. So now let me move. How do I move it? Uh-uh. Bear with me for one second. Um, so um, the patient is a 43-year-old female who has a his significant history of, I'd like to know how to move this out of here. Okay, I got it. Um, significant his, uh, past medical history for hypothyroidism, psoriatic arthritis, depression. She trains vigorously year round for marathons, triathlons, and other extreme sports. I don't know if you know about it, but she's part of, of the Spartan Up athlete, which is like beyond extreme sports. They're really, um, they, they do a lot of very damaging and um, difficult type of extreme athletics. She's on Embril and Stellara for um, the psoriatic arthritis for almost a decade. Her last dose was 12, 20, 21. So I figured I'd give you something really fresh. Um, she sustained a right tibial stress fracture in October of 2021, um, obviously as a result of one of her extreme sports endeavors. And her orthopedic surgeon placed her on meloxicam recommended a complete rest and referred her for physical therapy with repeat MRI in January of 2022. Nice, how do I go next? You go down at the bottom left and there's arrows down there and you can just advance it there on the other side, your no. left. Hold on, somebody's gonna come help me because I clearly am not doing anything here. Where is no, it's not doing anything. Hmm. Ah. Down, down at the bottom, yeah. there's your arrows. Yeah, you use that to go backwards and the other one to go forwards. Oh, hold on. I have to move this one right here. Okay, got it. It was hidden by Dr. Crozier. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah, that's always getting in the way. No, never. <laughs> so, um, okay, so our physical examination was she's five foot two, her height, uh, her weight was 61.2 kilograms. Her BMI was 24.3, had no issues except for the warm swelling along the right medial tibia, the gastroc and soleus tenderness, decreased ankle motion with plantar flexion and extension, otherwise neurovascularly intact. Everything else was within normal limits. The history was there's no uh, past surgical history. There is no known allergies to medication. She's a non-smoker. She does not use alcohol. She's a follower of Renaissance periodization, which is uh, for those of you who don't know, because I didn't know until she started seeing me, it's a very extreme diet that focuses on high carbs and very highly processed foods to give these people a lot of energy. Um, I will not pass any judgment on what I think about this diet. So the radiologic findings of the MRI on October 18th of the right tib fib showed a distal third of the right tibial shaft with extensive marrow edema, periosteal edema noted along the anterior and medial surfaces of the tibial shaft in that region. The right fibula was normal, the musculature and soft tissues were intact, and it was attributed a grade 4B Fredrickson medial tibial stress syndrome, severe shin splints of distal right tibial shaft 
which is actually what you would expect in somebody who does this kind of, ex of extreme exercise. So as I said to you, what I do, what we do is we layer the care. Um, we look at the patient from a 360 degrees and um, we look at everything that affects them, diet, exercise, stress management, lifestyle, and we layer the care. And peptides is one of the layers, but in this case, we started with the supplements that she was taking, which was adrenal support, which is ashwagandha and bovine um, adrenal extract, uh, as well as there's another extra thyroid extract and rhodiola. Um, then she was taking ADK orally, um, gentle iron and calcium, magnesium, butyrate. We added the PEPTAL protocol, which involved CJC epimorelin, 20 units, five nights a week, thymosin beta, 20 units, five nights a week, and BPC-157, one capsule twice daily. This is what she was on before this started. And then she was on the following medication. She was on Synthroid and Cytomel. She was on testosterone, progesterone. She was taking Zoloft and oxytocin nasal spray, low dose naltrexone and meloxicam as needed. So this is what we did between October, 2021 and January, 2022 as her peptide protocol. Keeping in mind that we also tweaked her diet, exercise, obviously she stopped exercising at least for a couple of minutes. Um, stress management, sleep, because she doesn't really sleep. She has two little kids um, and she's always running around. Um, so the peptide protocol involved TB500, which we, we constituted a very high strength and we gave it to her twice weekly for, once, uh, for one month. Um, and then we brought it down to 50 units once weekly thereafter. We added BPC sub Q, uh, also reconstituted in the high strength and 10 units daily. We started with one milliliter once and then 10 units daily. Uh, we stopped the CJC. Uh, we started MK677, uh, one cap every night before bed. And that was because she had been on CJ. C CJC and EPA for uh, months, and we thought it was time to try to stimulate other um, uh, receptors and that MK677 doesn't work exactly like CJC. So we would give her like a new lease on um, the um, hormone stimulation that you get from the CJC and the MK677. Then you can, we can also continue the oral BPC and even though we were doing the sub-Q BPC. Um, so following 12 weeks of rest, which was pretty impressive that this woman would do that, um, she started low impact running and walking and on one, on five, one five twenty two, she had no pain or symptoms. She had an MRI of the right tib fib on one twelve twenty two, and it showed the previously seen bone marrow and periosteal edema had essentially resolved. There was no localized soft tissue edema or encapsulated fluid collection, and they recommended a follow up MRI at three to six months. Um, at the time, the physical examination obviously supported what the MRI showed. Um, there was no more problem. There was no pain on the, over the tibial shaft. There was no edema and there was normal ankle motion. Um, the rest of her exam was always okay. So now it was just as okay. So her most recent status is that she had a stress factor that was healing, evidenced by the, recent, the reviewed studies. And um, she was cleared for training by the orthopedic surgeon and a follow-up MRI to ensure complete resolution in four months. So at the time we restarted the CJC, 20 units, five nights a week. Um, and then the peptide protocol that we followed was February Mar to March, which is now. We stopped the TB500. Uh, we continued the BPC sub Q. We stopped the MK677 because we started the CJC again, and we continued the BPP, BPC twice daily. So that's the case.
Anyone? What do we do next? Yes. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, we're, we're, we prop, we've got more than likely there's a question or two that'll pop up. I hope so. <laughs> well, of course. Mm -hmm. Maybe all peptides come in standard MG doses. I am not familiar with different companies. I wish these lectures would include the milligram doses instead of units. You know, it's a volume and I may constitute with small amount. You know, you're that good point. We'll, we'll work on that for you. Uh, you could also look at the monographs because the monographs have the dosage ranges uh, written into them. So that could also give you some insight uh, in terms of the, the milligram amount and the unit amount. Then um, if you want to answer that, Erica, you can yeah. do the dosing. Yeah, we we're can. No problem. Yeah, the TB500 was five milligrams per milliliters. So we're talking about 100 units of Q weekly, which is how many milliliters? How many milligrams? Uh, it's five, with, 500, yeah, 500 mics. With 500 mics. So that's the dose for that. The BPC is 15 milligrams per 1.5 cc's. So that's mm, how many? Uh, 25 units. Um, so that's also 500 micrograms. Also five, 500 micrograms. Um, the 25 M units, it's 500 micrograms on, on that. BPC sub Q, yeah. Very good. With a loading dose. Remember, we did a loading dose. That's correct. Was, Right. And you yeah. have your MK, you have your MK dosing on there. 25, right. And Very then PPC good. is 500 milligrams per count. I just want to ask, just because I've seen it, and I know this is you know, almost a lofting up a beach ball, but I mean, I can't help. How big of a difference was it when you started to be able to apply peptides to healing stress fractures, just, just stress fractures and connective tissue injuries? Like what was the you know, how do you see it in terms of the difference in your ability? Amazing. <laughs> I mean, I no words to describe because we were using BPC orally because of the gut, right? And that was the goal is to boost the immune system, the absorption, you know, of the nutrients. I mean, it was all gut focused and, you know, together, um, you know, with everything else we were doing the CJC, but when we added a BPC sub Q in acute fractures or acute injuries, it's remarkable. I mean, I was gonna present another case, but, I, but we couldn't get, I, I needed an X-ray and I'll tell you for in a second about it because it was a 27 year old who two weeks before her wedding broke her ankle. And the, I have, we have the pictures of before and after, and she healed remarkably, but we, we, we couldn't tr trust that you would believe us because we had, to, you know, we didn't have the x-ray, the original x-ray, but she healed and she was at her wedding dancing two and a half weeks later. And I have no doubt it was from the BPC sub Q because the oral BPC would not do anything like that. And, you know, nothing else, the TB 500 will not do anything like that. I mean, none of them would do it, but the BPC sub Q is tremendous. And, and it's quick and it works quickly. And then you just don't have to stay there for too long. I, I, let's see, wait a second. How much of her innate immune response contributed to her healing, if any? I would say that a lot of her innate response will always contribute to her healing. I mean, people, you know, we see it all day long because we have such amazing patients and we have such a great practice of people who are, all taking care of themselves. And as I said, we do like a 360 degree care. But the interesting thing is that these people heal faster than anything else. Like when you're talking about like COVID, we just had, you know, two years of it and not one patient in the practice wound up in the hospital, not one patient died. And we had two people who required monoclonal antibodies. And it's really interesting to see how well they do. And they, I think they do because first of all, to be thoughtful and aware, you have to be a patient in the practice. You have to already be there to be part of it, right? And then I think that 
one, once you start being aware of it, then you take care of yourself. And, you know, when you be, give somebody peptides or hormones or supplements and they work together and they're layered, as we said, what happens is that it's incentivizing the patient to take care of themselves, diet, exercise, stress management, sleep, and the results are remarkable. So yeah, of course, the answer to your question is the innate immune system will take care of everything and better when you're giving it the support, the substrates like the peptides we're talking about, the right diet, everything else we're talking about. Yeah, it never ceases to amaze me. I remember having a uh, a pro golfer with labrum surgeries, both you know, and, and some, uh, some other repair in the, in the shoulder capsule it's supposed to take 12 months. And in six months, he's out swinging a golf club and his, and his ortho was like, Hey, I don't know why this is healing, but you know, just countless cases of seeing just this incredible acceleration. And, and it's great when you do all the other things, right. It's like, this is just another tool in the toolkit. So it's fantastic. So, um, great case. Wait a second. We got one more. Okay. For those of us who are learning about peptides for the first time, where is a good place for me to start educating myself? You're in the right place. (laughs) This is the spot. I'd encourage you to, you know, come to a certification course. Uh, It, you get a lot of information quickly from all the top experts. Uh, So that's the way I would think of that. So just to keep us on time, thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Um, Love your expertise and the ease at which you apply. Yeah. Peptides is a part of your regimen. I also love that, that you, you, you look at the whole person because you can't ignore that. That's the other thing that we do with the society is we teach a lot about the nutrients you need and what sorts of diets work and all those kind of good things, because uh, that's how you get the best results. Um, now, I know this is great because we had a great ortho case there just now. Uh, and I know Gordon's going to, to uh, go into more of a you know, chronic, couple chronic illness cases. So, uh, Gordon, um, okay. all, of you know, Dr. Yeah, all of you know, Dr. Crozier from, uh, yes. maybe from teaching in the courses. So Gordon, take it away. Okay, good. Sorry about this. Take me a little bit of time. There we go. Uh, Okay. I'm trying to get my cortisol pumped up, Gordon. Come on. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, slide show from the beginning. Where's my forward on my cases here? Slide show. It's underneath one of these things. If you go to the middle, Gordon, it says slideshow. Where's the middle? It's right there. Go up, go up, just a little more, a little more. Go over the word slideshow and click it. Oh, the, it says chat up there. So <laughs> uh, you have to move your screen down a little bit. Or you could go to the bottom of your PowerPoint. Um, you may have to reduce your screen a little. Um, I'm going to save the questions till the end so all of the panelists can answer them. So if guys, we're not ignoring them. I'm not going to type them in. I actually want the panelists to Oops. kind of chime in on that. Okay. So Gordon, go right ahead. I'm sorry. I just lost it again. Uh, there we go. Here we go. You can use this button up here too. Which button? Top. If you go all the way up at the top, it's got the slide with the little arrow in it on the left-hand side. Right here? No. That's right-hand side. Go, oh, go to the other side. Go uh, to the other side where you see the screen. Right here. I'm trying to move this down so I can actually see because this other part is in my way. Sorry. Uh, you can. <laughs> this yeah. is always on the bottom, and for some reason, it's on the top this time. So I'm sorry. <laughs> um, boy, I've never had this much difficulty. I share these well, things. You know all what, the time. Gordon? Just yeah. go ahead and start your, just go ahead and start your. We can read your cases here. I can't see mine at all. 
<laughs> For some reason, I can't see mine at all. Uh, uh, I can't see any cases. Okay. Uh, I can't. I see my cases. Um, did you share your screen? Did did uh, Erica? Did you go off of stop screen share? Okay. There we go. I got it. I got it. There you go. Slideshow. Here we go. I I'm definitely love it. Okay. All right. So, um, so this uh, this case is a. Uh, I've shared this before, but for a lot of you, it might be a new one. And I've treated him for quite a while with peptides. Now he's a seven. He came to me as a seventy-four-year-old uh, male with a long history of Parkinson's. He's now seventy-eight. Is still doing peptides. Uh, he was on the ma maximum amount of medications for his uh, Parkinson's medications, uh, Cardopa, Levodopa. Uh, so he was on all these medications. His neurologist said, I can't do anything more for you. He said, perhaps you might look at some integrative medicines to uh, help with this. And so when his neurologist said that, he happened to see me on TV the next day. Uh, I don't know what I was doing on TV, but I was. Uh, so his major complaint was that his medications were only lasting for about two hours. Now, I never took him off of his Parkinson's medications. I never have done that. His neurologist has backed his dosages down since then, but I let his neurologist take care of that. So he was, uh, he was actually from New Jersey and he and his wife actually moved down here to, uh, to uh, Florida just to be close to me. And they go back and forth between Florida and uh, 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 New Jersey now. So when he first came, here's some of his uh, original labs. His glucose was extremely high, 105. Uh, his BUN was high, 28. His protein was low, 5.9. ACTH was high. Um, there's some more labs on the next page, but I have to deal with these abnormal labs. This is showing metaflammation, metaflammation, which is actually increasing his inflammatory response neurologically. So uh, because before I went in, uh, I was a physician assistant in neurology and neurosurgery before I actually went back to medical school. So I kind of love, uh, well, I don't kind of, I really do love uh, neurological cases. And, um, and so because of that, so I had to deal with his diet. I had to deal with his inflammatory markers. We had to get his glucose under control. And as you see his updated labs and his labs are still actually he's a little bit better. I just reviewed his labs this last week, which I couldn't get him up there, but his glucose now is, uh, 76. So he's improving still to this day. Uh, and that's four years later. Uh, his uh, C4A, which I don't do on everybody, but I did do on him because uh, he was doing a lot of work and he was constructing a plane in his basement. Uh, and he was big into and he made a whole cockpit and simulated the cockpit exactly. But he was working in his basement. So I really was worried about mold exposure for him as well. And uh, I think he probably did have because the C4A was 1060, which is extremely high. Um, and which now we have it down to 500. So it's in the normal range now. Uh, his uh, VIP was low, uh, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide. Look at his C-reactive protein, 11. He was an inflamed mess, which is actually going to cause neuroinflammation. I've got to get that neuroinflammation down for things to be, work, be able to work correctly. If I don't get inflammation down, I can throw all the peptides I want at somebody like this, and they're not going to do anything. So once again, it, you have to treat the whole person change their diet, uh, change what they're doing, make sure that they're taking appropriate supplements uh, and, and help with their inflammatory response because if you don't, you're really not going to get anywhere. So um, for his treatment modalities, I did do IV treatment modalities to begin with. Uh, they weren't for long, uh, but he did also have an, he had gone to a previous um, 
uh, functional physician who did not do anything about treating his, uh, some of his labs that were, I noticed were abnormal. And one of those happened to be uh, heavy metals. So we did treat him with IV chelation and some other things, some things that are not available at this time we did do, but at that same time, I also uh, gave IV, but I also started some other treatment modalities. So uh, I, I use something now, um, uh, a bioavailable form of glutathione. It's a nano form of glutathione. I also use uh, uh, a phosphatidylcholine. I now you lip, use lipid rescue. I love lipid rescue. People like it. They put it in their shakes. They put it in different things. It really helps with them. Phosphatidylserine to help with brain. Uh, Cell Health Assist, uh, which uh, I love that product. I always keep people on fiber. He's on sun fiber now along with probiotics. But the peptides that I began to use on him were C-Lank, C-Max, TA1 uh, at that point. Uh, and now he does uh, Thymulin at this point. And I'll, I'll explain those in a little bit because of some of you who don't really know, uh, TA1, uh, Thymus and Alpha-1 is no longer available uh, to us um, here uh, at this point in the United States. Um, I do have some people that uh, are in Europe and then they get their own peptides and I just tell them what to use and how to use it, uh, the ones, uh, my patients in Europe. So um, uh, also Dihexa. So Dihexa is a great peptide for neurological things uh, and uh, it works, uh, works great. There's new evidence on uh, Epithelon uh, because he was beginning to it felt like he was falling back a little bit. We just recently, in the last two weeks, started some uh, epitel on, on him, uh, and, uh, and he's already noticing some difference. So the C-Lank, the C-Lank, it, uh, it, it helps with the interleukin-6, and it actually helps with some of the expression of the neurotransmitters. Uh, it elevates uh, brain-derived neurotransmitters, BDNF, uh, and it actually has some antidepressant effects, uh, which af after he started this C-Lank, his wife began to tell me, I noticed that his, uh, he's happier, he's, uh, he's, he wants to go more, he's out doing more. Uh, so C-Lank is really important for those things. It help ma maintains homeostasis. It, it is cerebroprotective. Um, so I have used this in a number of my Parkinson's patients, and I still continue to use C-Lank uh, in a number of my patients and C-Lank. So uh, with him, he was one of my first ones I was starting on this. I was alternating C-Lank and C-Max, so I wasn't doing them continuously, both um, simultaneously all the time. I was kind of alternating them. And I found out through a number of patients, uh, because I've been doing this for so many years now, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of whole lot out there to really learn from, uh, but that's why we want to help you to be able to learn. And from some of my mistakes that I've made in the past, and some of uh, the information that I've gained through through studying and learning this, I realized that combining C-Lank and C-Max uh, really is uh, they work well together for a lot of these patients. Uh, and C-Lank, I also will use in some of my, my depressed patients. So C-Lank comes in a 3 ml bottle. It's 100, uh, 750 micrograms per ml. So I use the nasal spray. And, uh, and this is one to two sprays in, uh, in a single nostril uh, every day. Now you can go up a little bit on that. And I have on some of my other uh, Parkinson's patients. Um, but uh, for him, it was well, it's, he stabilized well. Uh, C-Max, he was also on C-Max. I started him on both of these. And C-Max uh, works through the mel melanocortin system and it, uh, is in, it's beneficial for memory, which is great for some of my Alzheimer's patients. But uh, I have several people on this. Um, but it, uh, it, the way it works, it works well and it works with serotonin levels as well. Uh, and a dopamine. So it helps with dopamine. That's why C-Max works extremely well in Parkinson's patients because it helps with your dopamine and your dopamine drive. Uh, I love uh, the combination of these. This also comes in a 3 ml bottle. 
Uh, it's 750 micrograms per ml. And the dosage is the same as the C-Lank. It's two, two sprays in a single nostril. So um, I just uh, have them, I, they do that. He does these simultaneously now. He will, uses one nostril for C-Lank, the other nostril for C-Max, and then he switches which nostril he's using every day. So I also put him on Dihexa. At that point, he was on Dihexa 20 milligrams. Uh, we did that for 30 days and he was doing it uh, four times a year. He wanted to increase it and we actually increased it to six times a year. Um, but because this does have some strong effects on the liver, you want to you want to monitor people. You want to make sure people are being monitored when you're doing these things. Uh, so, um, but I love dihexon, what it does. It actually works on the GDNF gene, which is a help, helps with the, uh, the neurological conditions. Uh, and it actually, with GDNF gene, that is part of the Hirschsprung's disease. So if you have anybody with Hirschsprung's, dihexa might uh, be a benefit to them. Uh, and and uh, it, it's great for them. And it, it improved his uh, cognitive functioning as well. And his wife had been complaining about that for some time. So now um, she's extremely excited to where he is four years later, and they have a very active life. He goes out golfing. So Dihexa comes in 10 or 20 milligram capsules. It is stabilized for oral use. Uh, and I love Dihexa because of that. And I had him on 20 milligrams. Uh, I'm seeing some studies come out now uh, where people are using Dihexa at 10 milligrams uh, and they're doing it for longer periods of time for some people. Uh, so, uh, you know, we still have to be careful. We don't know everything about how it's going to affect long term. Uh, and so, and you have to tell people, you know, you don't necessarily know all the long term effects of some of these things. However, Dihexa has been used for pretty uh, for a pretty long period of time uh, in in some areas of the world. Uh, so uh, Dihexa, there's 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 articles ranging back from the 1970s uh, about showing it and the procognitive effects. Uh, it does have a high affinity uh, for the growth factors in the uh, uh, the liver. Now, it, it induces uh, hippocampal synaptogenesis and spinogenesis. So that's the cool thing about Dihexa. Um, he did have an initial, and I didn't include it in on here, uh, he did have an initial MRI. Uh, so I do a lot of neuroquants on a lot of my patients. He did have a neuroquant done originally. We're trying to get his insurance to pay for a repeat neuroquant at this point to see four years later uh, doing all these uh, peptides and what he's doing uh, to see if there's any uh, improvement of his neuroquant. He believes there is an improvement, so he really wants it. And uh, so we're trying to get his insurance to pay for that. So um, that's, that's that study. And I, I, I do a, quite a few uh, Parkinson's patients. Now Crohn's, uh, I get a lot of Crohn's patients probably because of my own history. I have a history of Crohn's myself. And uh, I did write a book which uh, was pushed a lot by some people. And uh, so I have these people calling from all over the country with a history of Crohn's. And uh, this patient, uh, I could have picked a number of patients because I have so many uh, Crohn's patients uh, that, I, that I've treated with peptides. I also have a, uh, that I can't use right now, but I'm getting his approval to use it. He was, uh, he's a baseball player. He's a pro baseball player that um, I treat for his Crohn's disease. So some of these Crohn's patients, a lot of their gastroenterologists have given up on them. Um, she was actually asked to give her story in a magazine that covers Central Florida here. Uh, they usually only cover uh, uh, traditional types of medicines in this paper, but for some reason they picked her and she interviewed for him and she gave the story. Uh, so it was kind of interesting. Uh, but she was a 42-year-old female, very active mother of two, 
Uh, she was on biologics. She had been on multiple different biologics uh, for several years. Uh, she kept having breakthroughs and she was explaining to me that she would, these treatments were expensive. Her insurance wouldn't pay for the biologics and they were so expensive for, expensive for her. And she really didn't want to continue on them because when she would have breakthroughs, it was terrible. Well, what she didn't tell me, and I found out later after I even tried it, started her treatment modalities, is that uh, she had uh, lived in a very moldy home for three years and they had to move out. And her home was in Vermont. So she and her husband uh, moved down to Florida for some reason, I don't know why, uh, but they had moved down here and they'd heard about me uh, through, through a relative uh, that uh, travels back and forth from Vermont to Florida and I treat uh, her and but she's now, this lady was now becoming sensitive to all types of things and all types of cleaning products. Her diet was extremely limited. In fact, she would only eat pureed foods a lot of the time because she would have so much abdominal pain and discomfort. Uh, so um, what I like to do for these people is really figure out what healing looks like to them and what their goals are for healing. Because you can have a lot of these people, especially if they've had Crohn's disease since childhood or uh, something that they don't, they don't, they can't even envision themselves being well. And those people I don't think are really great candidates for things. They might get a little bit of improvement, but they aren't gonna be completely better. And, uh, but she, she really had a motivation. She had two young children. She wanted to go back up to Vermont. She wanted to get back into skiing. Um, and, and you can see from her picture, she really is uh, a picture of health now. Uh, and so what I do first is I like them to, to learn modalities into dealing with their stress. She was high stressed all the time. And then, uh, Immediately, I uh, wanted to make sure that her labs were not abnormal. Her labs were actually perfect, and she didn't have any HLA DRBQ that would lead me to think that she would have long term issues from mold exposure. So I didn't really think that she had any mold exposure because her labs were perfectly normal. She really had really pretty low inflammation. Um, but she really ate pretty fairly healthy. She tried not to eat anything with preservatives in, and she was really on a fairly clean diet to begin with, other than she couldn't tolerate some health foods and some of the healthier foods that we really want people to be able to take. Um, but so I did start her on thymosin alpha, alpha one, which is available back then. Uh, she's actually been converted over. Now she takes thymulin. Uh, and uh, these both will uh, modulate the immune system, which I think that's critical in, in a Crohn's or ulcerative colitis patient is modulating the immune system because the immune system is being overdriven. That's why biologics work for them a lot of times. They don't work in all people, but they work in some people, and that's what we want to achieve for these people. Uh, we want their immune system to be modulated so they're not attacking their own gastrointestinal tract. Um, so I started her on thymosin alpha-1. I also started her on BPC-157. When they're really severe like this, and she had already stopped her biologics when she came to me, she just said she wasn't doing them anymore. She didn't see the benefit. Uh, so she had already stopped them. I have other people that are referred to me from gastroenterologists who know that I deal with peptides and they have um, outreached all their limits on all the biologics that they can use and they uh, really can't use anymore. Uh, so for her, I started on BPC-157 oral and sub -Q both at the same time. Her oral dose was a little bit higher uh, than a lot of people do, but I did 500 milligrams three times a day. Um, it Gordon, was that 500 milligrams or micrograms? Micrograms, I'm sorry. Yeah, it should be micrograms. So uh, 500 micrograms three, three times a day. And I also uh, started her on KPV. 
I'm having a hard time getting KPV now. So I didn't even include the dosage because KPV, I, I, I can't get it right now. I, I've been trying everybody trying to get KPV and uh, I can't get, so I didn't include the dosage on that, but she was on KPV uh, uh, back then uh, as well. And uh, KPV is a very interesting peptide that decreases uh, gastrointestinal inflammation. Uh, and it, it really is uh, cool on how it works on, uh, on inflammation and bringing inflammation down in the gastrointestinal tract. I like to combine BPC and KPV when it's available. Um, and I, I haven't found it available uh, presently. So today, um, she, she actually, I just got a letter from her recently uh, just thanking me for all the care. And she did move back up to Vermont. She's managing her father's dental practice, which is high stress. Uh, she's continuing. After we got her stable, she was, she was no longer, she has two to three normal bowel movements a day. That's what she's having at this point. When she came in, she was having 15 bowel movements every day. They were not normal. They weren't formed. They were... Um, she was having a lot of issues with her bowel movements and a lot of abdominal discomfort, really uh, to the point where she really couldn't work at that point and she couldn't function uh, normally and care for her two children uh, because of the amount of abdominal pain she was having. So at this point, we backed way off and here it says my, uh, milligrams again, it's micrograms. So she's on, on BPC 157, uh, one per day at this point. Uh, occasionally we will do thymulin, uh, not all the time. Uh, when we can find KPV, we'll do KPV. And the one thing I found out is that I had to start her on fiber extremely slow because Crohn's and ulcerative colitis patients, they will have a lot of abdominal discomfort when you start fiber immediately. Uh, none of us eat enough fiber in our diet diet, um, but I did start her on fiber. She does take her fiber every day now, uh, and she is able to uh, eat regular foods where she's not at pureeing most of her meals at this point. So uh, I do do consults for where we do Zooms uh, from now, uh, from time to time. Um, and so she's on a uh, four-month schedule. So every four months, she has a Zoom with me. Uh, just to make sure that we're staying stable where she's at. Now, she knows she can get a hold of me at any time if she starts to have breakthroughs or anything. But the amazing thing is she hasn't had any breakthroughs. She has had no um, bleeding. She's had uh, normal bowel movements throughout. The only time that she had a little bit of a difficult time was uh, when she had ended up with COVID. And then she ended up with uh, some pretty bad uh, diarrhea for um, about six weeks. Uh, and, but we did get her back on track and we got her back to normal. And that's when we increased her BPC-157. We did increase her thymulin at that point. Uh, and uh, so we did increase uh, different things. Um, so thymusin alpha-1, uh, I don't, I probably shouldn't go into it very much because it's really not available at this part, uh, point anymore. Uh, but the other people in other countries can get it. Um, and, but it's a very cool, uh, cool peptide. And uh, what it worked for, for me, as I first started using it, because I had patients, uh, in, we have a fairly large uh, uh, community with HIV here in, in Orlando. And I had a lot of those with hepatitis B and hepatitis C, and I used thymus and alpha one, and it really worked well for them. Uh, and it really worked well in my HIV patients that I had um, that really had nothing else that could really work for them. So it worked extremely well, um, but because of its ability to modulate the reactive oxygen species, that's why I use it in a lot of neuroinflammation patients back then at the time too. Um, but it's uh, great in modulating the immune system. That's how it used to be uh, provided. So thymulin, and you notice that I said about thymulin. Uh, I don't know how many people are using thymulin right now, but it's a peptide produced by the thymic epithelial cells. Uh, and it induces differentiation of the T cells. 
It also modulates the immune uh, immune dysfunction. So it's good with uh, people that are overdriven or underdriven in their immune system. Um, what I'm finding with thymulin, really people that are underdriven in their immune system, it works better for them, not necessarily overdriven, um, but it helps with viral and bacterial infections. And a lot of people with Crohn's and all sorts of colitis, they have abnormal bacteria in their gut, in their colon, which needs to be uh, balanced out. And so you're going to balance that out with thymulin. And then you also need to have them on the right and correct uh, probiotics for that, for, for their specific, uh, issues, uh, and what they're having. Uh, so that's, that's kind of imperative for them and then getting them on the right things that will actually, they can, uh, reconstitute and regrow normal gut bacteria, which is going to help them heal in their Crohn's and also of colitis as well. So, um, so thymulin also is, uh, regeneration normalization. So it's gonna help the regeneration of cells and normalization of cells. And it also is anti-inflammatory. You can find articles on PubMed on what thymulin does and anti-inflammatory, uh, kind of cool. Uh, I, I, read, I try to read my articles every day, but thymulin is one of those cool ones that I think um, is, is really a good, um, good starting point uh, for uh, peptides. Uh, and I do use it a lot. <laughs> so uh, thymulin is, a, is one I use in a lot of things. Uh, so TB4 is not available anymore. Um, so I don't really use that much anymore. Um, and, but it does uh, upregulates uh, antioxidants. It's neuroprotective, uh, neurorestorative. Um, and I, I love, uh, I loved thymus and beta-4 when it was available because it really helped on a lot of my Sears patients, which that can be part of their issue as well. That was the dosage I used to use. So BPC, uh, it is stabilized for oral use. We still do use it sub-Q because I think I love it sub-Q, especially for people that cannot tolerate anything orally. Uh, and some patients I have that are it's in such severe distress gastrointestinal-wise they can't even take any pill or any supplement. Uh, so, um, but what I will have them do is, uh, is open the capsule of BPC-157 and just uh, take the ingredients or put it in uh, a little bit of water and drink it down. But uh, it, it really helps heal the gastrointestinal tract. It really accelerates healing. It helps with tendon and bone repair, as you heard before. Uh, it decreases pain. So people with my gastrointestinal pain, it really helps them in a lot of their pain uh, in, in that specific area. Uh, is it perfect? No, we might have to go to something else. And sometimes I do to go to other things for gastrointestinal pain in some of these pa patients. Uh, it helps heal rectovaginal fistulas. And I have a great, I'll share that at a different time, but I have a great story about a rectal vaginal fistula uh, in one of my patients that BPC-157 really helped uh, a great deal. Uh, and it does help with a nerve repair in animal studies. That was done in animal studies, okay? <laughs> so um, five mLs, uh, 0.15. I, I, that was what was uh, recommended way back then. I don't use that any anymore. I use uh, higher doses than 0.15 sub-Q. Uh, I, it's much, much higher than that now. And then the 500, 500 microgram capsules, they're, um, wonderful. I have a lot of people on, um, BPC 157, 500 micrograms capsules all the time. Uh, and as you can see, um, this patient, she's been on it for uh, several years now. Uh, without any consequences, without any uh, problems. And it's been continuous that she's been on it. And it's really helped her have a better life. So, questions? Uh, Gordon, um, let's... Here we go. So, a um, couple, there's a couple questions for both you and uh, Eric. I think can weigh in on these. I think the first one is though, what is the current dose that you're doing with BPC 157? So, my current dose for BPC 157 that I use sub Q 
uh, I used 0.25 uh, uh, on the insulin. You know, these are like little insulin syringes, so 0.25. So you're going up to around 400 to yes. 400 micrograms. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, first question. Uh, if you use BPC for gut, does it need to be oral or does sub-Q work too? Uh, I think, I think it works sub Q as well. Uh, but because I, and uh, the reason I say that is because a lot of my patients couldn't tolerate anything orally at first. So I had to start somewhere. So I started with it sub Q because they couldn't take it orally. Um, when they were able to tolerate it orally, then I converted them over to oral because I really like it, uh, localized to the gastrointestinal tract. They also, I think there's some places are making BPC-157 um, uh, 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 suppositories, which can be used as well. Okay, great. Um, this is for both of you. How do you decide on which peptides to use for a specific indication and when and why to stop a peptide? That's a big why question first got to learn about the peptides and where their applications are. So, you know, peptides, there's all kinds of applications to them. So you'll, whatever condition or situation you're in, you would pick peptide specific um, to the indication of what you're trying to approve, you know, what you're trying to improve or, or resolve. So that's one shot at it. And what about when and why to stop? Erica, what about um, when and why to stop a peptide? I like the way you kind of moved in and out of your peptides on that case. Um, well, you know, in acute cases, like the one I presented, the one with the uh, broken tibia, um, in acute cases, I mean, you want you know, the BPC, we kind of use the oral BPC we use as baseline for everybody kind of just immune boosting gut, but acutely we start, we do the sub Q and we go up like what, you know, you guys just said 500 micrograms, we go up, a, you know, sub Q and we do it for in cycles. We do it for maybe six weeks, 12 weeks, and then we get out. Um, then, you know, at the same time, we do CJC epimorelin because that's another mainstay um, that will work in acute injury. So like, you know, we have patients who want it for anti-aging, to build muscle, to feel better, to have better immune systems, and they just stay on CJC epimorelin for a long time. Um, Eventually, we take them off because you don't want to lose the positives by stop, by keeping them on them forever and your body just doesn't respond to it anymore. Um, I think that what we do is we rotate them. And like that's why we were talking about MK766 before that. Uh, we took her off the CJC because she had been on it for a long time. Then she had the acute event, so we changed her to the MK so that there would be something else on board. But I think that we kind of try to rotate and to have them stay in cycles because everything in the human body goes in cycles. So it works really nicely when you give, you know, six week cycles, 12 week cycles. It turns out that we find that, and you know, the data supports it, that CJC epimoralin usually takes at least six weeks to start seeing results in someone who's in their forties trying to just improve their general wellness. And so you have to stay beyond six weeks because at six weeks, if they start feeling it at six weeks, you don't want to take it out. So we go 12 weeks um, acutely, like you, Dr. Crozier just was saying about um, TA you know, one, the problem is that thymus and alpha doesn't exist anymore, so we can't use it anymore, but we would do it in cycles as well when we used it. Now we're using thymulin the same way. In cycles, we also do it IV, so you don't constantly bombard the patient with a ton of them. The other thing is that it's the cost, and peptides are pretty expensive, so we use peptides as, as I said, as a layering piece. And after we've done diet, exercise, lifestyle, as you said too before, but then 
hormones are really a lot cheaper and we start we make sure that their hormone balance is optimized before we start with peptides but because peptides are really very hot these days everybody wants peptides so we try to put together peptides that work well. I think what you were talking about before, Gordon, the um, Solank and the CMAC are excellent. And, you know, we have a lot of patients who benefit mentally from doing these, uh, using these peptides. So in cycles and don't stay with one longer than three or four months and just rotate them. Great. Um, yeah, and I mean, you know, specific ones, semi-glutide and say MOT SC for helping people with their blood sugar, right? right. So you got blood right. sugar, you got right. muscle, you got nerve, you know, but you got to you gotta learn about them and then you'll know how to pick, pick and select. Well, semi-glutide, you know, you're right. What you're saying is very important, actually, that because we didn't touch on semi-glutide. Um, I think everybody and their mother wants to be on semaglutide today. I mean, I think patients are coming in just specifically, they want to take semaglutide. So Ozempic, if the right. insurance covers, they'll take Ozempic. If they doesn't, then they have it compounded and they have semaglutide. And we're having amazing results with semaglutide. Absolutely. Doing really well. How do you how do you find it? Yeah, uh, same. Right. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. So let's let I got a lot of questions, guys. So we got I want to try and get them all answered. So um, uh, any any problems with taking BPC 157 indefinitely? I have not well, seen. had someone on it for seven years. So I think you're, you're, you're I you're, haven't seen any problems with it. I've had people on it for years uh, and they haven't had any real problems. Now, I do encourage them to sometimes take a little bit of a break, um, but some of these people, because it's traumatic to them to stop it when they've had gastrointestinal issues where they've not been able to, uh, like my, my baseball player, he, right. he couldn't play, he couldn't function, he, you know, he was losing weight. Uh, so uh, BPC-157, I actually had to write a special note for him to be on BPC-157 uh, for, uh, because he's, you know, he plays, uh, for a major league team. Uh, but he's been on it for a long time and he's had no, uh, bad outcomes. I've had, I have probably six people that have been on it for years. Yeah. I, I find the same thing. People stay on them permanently, but you know, it's interesting what you just said that, um, somebody sent me recently, um, something from one of the, um, testing facilities about for like athletes, right? That BPC is considered, a, it's part of the anti-doping, the, the do, it's considered doping. So it is, they didn't want, yeah. That That's they didn't part of the WADA, WADA right? rule. Yeah, you got to look on all the WADA bands. Somebody just asked me that today. I mean, yeah. they, they have to realize they're testing for metabolites too. It's not just the fact you right. read about it and it has a four minute half-life. It's the tail of the half-life that's the problem. And they yeah. test for that. So- yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, why we had to go through a formal inquiry. So he was off of it for a period of time. Um, but when they began to see that, you know, he was beginning to decline again, they began to see that his was actually for a real reason. Uh, and it was for his uh, for his Crohn's. So, you know, for that, you know, we did get an exception, but most most athletes are not going to get an exception just to be on them. <laughs> right. What about uh uh, C max, um, intranasal versus, uh, sub Q, any different application difference in application effect. And then also, uh, could someone comment on C max for use in young adults with ADHD? Oh yeah. So, uh, I love C max for, uh, for young adults and ADHD. Uh, I, um, I think it works tremendous for them and it really helps with their concentration ability and be able to stay focused and be able to learn because it does help with the learning capabilities. Um, so I've also used it in some autistic children and it's worked well for them. In autistic children, um, some of them, I could not get them to actually do nasal spray. So we did have to do sub Q for them. 
Um, but I, I see, I think that, that, uh, the intranasal has very good effects, especially for what I'm doing, because, you know, the cribiform plates up here, it's fairly thin. Uh, you can, you do the intranasal, it's going to get neurologically where you want it fairly quickly. Uh, and that's why I like the intranasal. Um, I haven't, I only have one patient that ever liked it sub Q and said that they had better results sub Q. So all my patients have all liked it nasally, uh, intranasal. All right, let's go. Uh, what peptide would be best for rebuilding myelin? Hmm. That's a toughie. I mean, you think of the growth factors like the growth hormone, uh, ipamorelin, CJC combination, maybe a secondary application. I mean, I think, you know, BPC helps with at least BDNF. So maybe you've got to think about, you know, a, a combination, something like that. But what do you guys think? Myelin is difficult. And first, <laughs> I think you have to, you have to get rid of the offending agent. What is causing demyelination? Yeah. Um, it, you figure it out, figure out what's causing Metals, biotoxins, whatever it is. Got to look right. around, right? There's a ton of them. You know, there's environmental, yeah. there's tons. There's a ton of different things that cause demyelination. Yeah. So figure that out first, because you can, you can pour all the peptides you want at something. If you haven't corrected the underlying fact, you're not going to help with peptides. That's why I always, I do on a lot of my patients, almost all of them, I do amino acid profiles too, because what are peptides? They're amino acids. So uh, I, I like to know what their amino acid profile is because that needs corrected as well. And there's, there's so many people don't have enough uh, amino acids on board, but I would, I would say I would probably do a combination, BPC-157, dihexa, um, some of those things, but you also have to make sure that people are getting the proper fats. So phosphatidylcholine is going to help with that. There's other things that are going to help with that. Okay. What about, uh, we got a few more questions and I know we got to call it a day and I'm trying, trying to get all of them we can. Uh, so can BPC oral help with musculoskeletal or injections needed? Uh, Erica, you had mentioned that you, you go with injections to start and then you'll switch them over. I think you answered that, didn't you? Yeah. I think we said that during an acute phase injury, sub-Q works well. Um, the same thing we used to do with thymus and beta. We don't do it anymore because we don't get right. it anymore. Right. Um, and then the oral stays as is. Yeah. The oral continues. Uh, any luck you like, these are all good questions for people who are just reaching out on practice. I'm just trying to get them in here. Any luck using BPC or KPV in patients with both acute and chronic diverticulitis? You know, obviously lifestyle is very important for this diagnosis. So, I, yeah. Uh, but wondering if there's any positive results. Yeah. In conjunction with diet, butyrate, spermidine, the, a yeah. few other things you have to do. Right. And they work really nicely. Yeah. Exactly. Um, why are these peptides not available? I guess they're talking about TA, TB4 and TA1. That's just FDA, you know, moving things around like Tessamorelin, the, the peptide length was too long. Mm -hmm. Now you can't get it. So it's a little bit of a moving target on some of these, uh, in, uh, some of these peptides. Uh, but it's not that you can't get them. It's just that some of them are now moved to, to, uh, you know, either orphan or a different status specific for a condition. Um, can patients who are breastfeeding use semaglutide? I'll let you guys answer that. We haven't used it in anybody who's breastfeeding. Um, I think that there, I don't see that there, I don't know that there is any data on it, a support or in support or against it. Um, and I would imagine that, the, you know, let your body do the healing at that point. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's a, that's, if that's someone who is, you know, diabetic, their, their specialist is going to be managing their Ozembic. And if it's not someone who's diabetic, if it's all, oh, I just want to lose my baby fat. Why don't you just wait till you're done breastfeeding before right. you do things like that? You know, right. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty conservative on the, the you know, what you put in your body when you're breastfeeding, yeah. you know, put nutrients in there, you know, right. exactly. I, I think Ozempic, 
I think azempic is a category C or maybe it had been a D in pregnancy. So I don't know. I, I, I'm pretty sure it is one of those. I can't remember right now. I'd have to look back, but I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah. So I think we got them all. Uh, I really want to just thank both of you for spending your time with us tonight. I and mean, it was fantastic. And I love your both your just depth of knowledge and the, how you utilize peptides in, in practice. And, you know, what's best about it is, is I know both of you as practitioners, once again, if you can add peptides as a part of a more comprehensive plan, that's how you really end up getting the most benefit out of them. Sure. And acute situations are going to work. But uh, just thank you both. Uh, Amy, do you want to take us out? Yeah, I just want to remind everybody who's still on with us, we will be sending you the recording of the webinar uh, within the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, and again, want to thank Dr. Crozier and Dr. Schwartz with, uh, for being with us tonight. And always, Jim, uh, you're all just have awesome wisdom on all of this uh, topic. Um, but also want to remind everybody too, uh, the International Peptide Society, which is peptidesociety.org, uh, we do offer a membership. Um, you can get a discount of $100 using the code A4MNEW. Um, once you're a member, you get a login to our sort of our private site uh, where we're building this fabulous monograph library. Uh, you heard Jim mention a couple times about, uh, you know, looking at the monograph. And Jim's got a great team of uh, himself and some scientific writers who are doing a really deep dive on all the research uh, for these peptides um, to understand the dosing, to understand the indications, but also so that you have access to all the peer reviewed research for these peptides and can feel confident um, prescribing them, utilizing them um, as adjunct therapy for your patients. Um, in addition, at some point in time here, probably not too far off here in the, the future, we'll be um, asking for all of our members to share cases, just like uh, Dr. Crozier and Dr. Schwartz are so great sharing their knowledge for, for uh, cases. We wanna start collecting uh, redacted uh, patient case information so we can have a, a good library of success stories. Um, peptides, as Jim said, it's a moving target. Uh, we know at some point in time, and, and there already is sort of a grassroots uh, movement to make sure that uh, we can still use peptide therapy for our patients. Um, and we know that being able to collect these uh, successful patient outcomes is, is going to be key for all of us to continue to use this because uh, it's important. Obviously, you know, amazing healing properties, um, great outcomes um, in many cases. Uh, so that, so stay tuned for that. If you're a member of IPS or if you're considering joining, um, we also have a great little community that we're getting going so that uh, all the members can mentor each other. If you've got questions like that you asked this evening, um, our membership base will be able to help uh, mentor you as well. So we, we've got a peptide course starting in 10 days. Uh, our peptide module one will be in Nashville. Um, I did put a little information about the courses in the chat. Uh, we do offer the courses in person every year. Um, it's two modules of 24 hours each, um, but we also offer them in, online uh, uh, as an enduring activity. So they are CME activities. Um, again, we'd love to have you there live with us. We'll be in Nashville next week and uh, also in uh, Boston in September for our second module, peptide module, but again, also available online. So just want to thank everybody for being with us and watch for us in March because we'll we'll be coming at you again with some more cases. Oh yeah, come come to come to, to the March presentation. We have fun. We have a lot of fun in the class. Everybody shares their insights and wisdom. All the instructors hang out and help out with your learning. I mean, you can't. I'm, I'm telling you, we we uh, had, we got an A plus on our first one that we did. So we did. We're excited about that. So thanks everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.